And I, I want to read uh, a scripture up front, and then I'm going to share what's on my heart. Uh, the scripture is Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. And this is a really, really beautiful portion of scripture to come around anytime we're talking to crew uh, leaders or people in our crews. And this is what it says, starting in verse 42. And they, that's the early church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Verse 43, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Verse 46, and day by day, someone say day by day. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And I want to use this uh, scripture for a few moments tonight, and I titled this message, I would never preach this anywhere else but here. Uh, I want to preach from the subject, the Vu secret sauce. It's, it's, it's secret sauce night. I want to talk to you about the secret sauce. Um, when I first moved to Miami, it was 1998. I moved from Tacoma, Washington. Uh, many of you have been a part of our church for a while, and you've kind of heard our story, but uh, my dad had a burden on his heart, had a word from the Lord to uproot his entire family from the Pacific Northwest, move to the vibes of Miami to take over a little Assemblies of God church off of I-95. It's called Trinity Church. And um, it was quite the move for our family. It was a shock, as I've said. One of these days, I just need to explain to you, as I say that, all the things that I mean by it. But you can just imagine how different Tacoma, Washington, uh, that's the most granola place on the planet, <laughs> um, compared to being a 14-year-old kid coming to Miami. Um, I, and I remember even tonight, like these guys up here trying to dance. I remember I went into my freshman year, and shout out to uh, all of um, our Spanish friends, but... I didn't even know where Cuba was, let alone, I'd never heard what a quin, is it a quinceta, a quince? Yeah, I had no idea. But yo, I went to like 10 of those things. So I'm in like salsa classes because you can't go to a quinceta without being able to do it, you know, a little bit. Oh, you don't even, oh, you don't even, okay. So it's a whole thing, but. But it was culture shock to say the least. And, uh, growing up, I, I lived right next door to my grandparents. It was like kind of like this picture-perfect little world. My, my grandparents were our literal neighbors. And so my dad traveled a whole lot uh, growing up. He was a preacher. He was an evangelist, uh, sort of an old-school model, but he was gone the majority of the week for the first 14 years of my life. So I saw him on Fridays and Saturdays, and he was out. Um, so my grandparents, in many ways, raised me growing up. And my grandmother was my piano teacher. My grandmother was, like, was my best friend, like, no doubt about it. Nana, best friend. And um, she used to cook dinner a lot for us. And the thing that we really loved growing up was that she made this, this gravy that was just like fire. I don't know how to explain it to you. It was just like... I, it was just the best. It was like, and, and it, was, it was a staple. Like, like, I moved to Miami, it's like beans and rice are a staple. Um, Nana's gravy was a staple in my home. And it sounds so funny, but I remember when we were moving, and you know, you know when you cry so hard, you have that, you like, can't catch your breath, you know? <laughs> like, I remember, I remember crying, we're leaving, and the dumbest thing came out of my mouth as I was saying goodbye to my grandparents at her house. I was like, but Nana, what about your gravy? <laughs> So dumb, but we uh, we moved to Miami, and I was I was we were at home. We were trying to get acclimated. It was really really uncomfortable, and it was it's challenging. And I remember one night, my mom was like, "Rich, I got good news for you. I've made Nana's gravy." I was like, "Okay, yeah, let's let's do it." And uh, I remember she she served it that night. And how how many of y'all know it was like? I'm like, "Who are you, you imposter?" You know, this is. <laughs> I was like, Mom, this is not it. Like, thank you for your effort, but, you know, yeah, yeah. You know E for effort. Um, 
And she's like, she, I remember she was like, let me get, she goes, let me get the recipe again. So she called my grandmother, she got the recipe again. She made it again, followed all the ingredients, all the things to make Nana's gravy. She made it a second time, and then the same thing. It was like, yo, this is not up to par. And I remember she tried a third time, and it was like, she went, called my grandmother back. It's the same thing. It couldn't measure up. And we went through all the ingredients, went through all of the stuff, but how many know the one thing that was missing from Nana's gravy was? Nana. Nana. Oh, someone said secret sauce. I love you, like trying to be ahead of it, you know? Um, <laughs> where's you going? I love you so much, that's beautiful. I love it, a group of preachers. No, 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 no. This is not, there's no twists and turns. Um, where's he going? Oh, no. Um, the thing that was missing from it was Nana. Yeah. Was Nana. Meaning you, you, you get all the ingredients right, you get all the formulas, all the measurements, all the metrics, all the charts, but it's Nana yeah, good. that's the secret sauce. Yeah. And if you're asking me tonight, because people come to us all the time like, yo, what's this? And they say it in more proper ways. It depends on where they come from, you know? Right. But from people from, you know, when, when they come from uh, Montana, they're not like, what's the secret sauce? It's more like, Ex can you explain to us? But some people are like, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Now I'm stereotyping people, but like, but people are like, what's the, what's the secret sauce? Yeah, good. And just for this room and those that are online right now, here's the secret sauce. The secret sauce is you. Good. Amen. You are the secret sauce. What's the secret sauce of Vu Church? Vu Cruz. Vu Cruz. And I am going to in a moment, start raising my voice very, very loud because I wanna try to get this into your heart and I feel like sometimes I can't make a point unless I shout it. Um, but like all the stuff, all the things, the secret sauce is you. It's Vu Cruz. The early church, the early church was marked with two ingredients, going to the temple and going to each other's homes. That's Acts chapter two, verse 46. And day by day, someone say day by day attending the temple together, that's going to church, going to a group gathering, going to a large gathering, and then breaking bread in their homes. So what I'm saying is, is that we need large group celebration and then we need small group fellowship. What is the secret sauce of the church? It is large group celebration and then it's small group fellowship. And this is my... I have a lot of points, but I promise you this is my only point tonight because I, I want you to march out of here tonight as we step into 2023, as we finish out the next three crews, that you're hearing it from me. The secret sauce is not the preaching on Sunday. The secret sauce is not the new album that's coming out. The secret sauce is not the merch. The secret sauce is not the IG. The secret sauce is not the young people. The secret sauce is you. So this is what, you, you gotta write one note down. This is the note I got, you, maybe you didn't write the Bible verse down, you gotta write the note down. Because this is, you're gonna hear this, and we've said this many times, but it's a new way to say it. Crews are not a program of our church. They are our church. That's it, like, 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 crews are not a program of our church. They are our church. Your body is made up of cells. Let me just tell you, our church, the body of Christ, is made up of cells. They're called crews. And our church will never be healthier than the crews that make up the body. Just like your body will never be healthier than your cells. If your cells are broken apart, if they're not healthy, your body won't be healthy. And so how does our church grow? How does our church get stronger? It happens in the crews. And as we look at our church, I think more and more that our church has to grow larger and our church has to grow smaller. We have to grow larger in worship and we have to grow smaller in fellowship. What you're doing matters. Larger in worship, smaller in fellowship. We are the cells of this body. It's not a program, it's not an add-on. In fact, like I, I, like I love people that come on Sundays, God bless them, but I'm telling you what, I don't really think you're a part of Voo Church unless you're in a crew. I just, I just don't, like, like, like I, I love you, I'm for you. But people that tell me they're all about this mission and vision and they're not in a crew, I'm like, I don't really get what you're doing. Thanks for spectating, thanks for, for coming. But like, I'm telling you what, if you wanna be a part of the mission of this thing, if you wanna be a part of the secret sauce of this thing, you've got to be in a crew. That, that's, that's what we're talking about tonight. And I, I want us to get this into our hearts because 
over and over again as we look at our church. I, I read a stat, or I heard a study, I should say, a couple weeks ago, and um, it was Rick Warren who said it, so I believe it's true, but this is what he said. He said that if people show up to church and um, within a year they don't make seven friends, they're gonna leave that church. And so like, I think VU has a really big front door. I like the front door of our church. I think it's an attractional place. I think it's a welcoming place. It's a lovely place. I think people look at it and go, I wanna go there. But I do not want our big front door to be equally rival with a big back door. And if you wanna close the back door of a church, you actually have to get people into crews. You have to get people into community. Why? Because the pastor might guess some people there, but it's the people who are gonna keep them there. It's on you and I. We wanna grow in a healthy way. Not everything that's doable is sustainable. And the way that we sustain the growth, the way that we sustain the big front door is men and women like you that rise up and go, I'm a part of the secret sauce. I'm the missing ingredient. What my part is, is massive. It's what brings the flavor to this church. And at VU, we have the thing called the growth track, which is about four steps. It's about encountering God, establishing your beliefs, getting equipped, and then being empowered to change the world. And this is why in our crews, we must raise up and release leaders because everything we're doing here tonight is about empowering people. It's about giving people an opportunity. P please understand, we're not trying to build a personality-driven church. We're trying to build a purpose-driven church. This is important, like, I, you gotta know this. By the way, I haven't spoken at a crew catch-up in like a year and a half. Not because I don't know how to, not because I don't want to, but because we actually wanna sustain and we wanna grow beyond one person. Tonight you're seeing the platform, it's full of all sorts of different people. There's different worship leaders. That's all on purpose. Yeah. The people that have the microphone at the moment are not necessarily always the most skilled or the most talented. It's because we're raising up yeah. and we're releasing and empowering people. <laughs> I'm really excited in a second, but I, I wanna make sure that I'm teaching this because this is very, very biblical that you understand it. This is a church meeting tonight. This is a leadership meeting. And this idea of structure, which some of you are like, man, if you haven't gone through the crew handbook, notice there is lots of structure. Shout out to Kyle Graham, who's in the room tonight. My goodness, this couple right here helped draw up all these original blueprint plays that are still working, but it's structure because a structure holds a body together. But structure is not something we came up with. Exodus chapter 18 is where you start to see biblical structure first in place. There's this guy named Moses, remember Moses? And Moses is real tired because he's trying to do everything on his own. He's trying to preach at everything and teach at everything. He has to be at every crew. He has to be at every hospital visit. He has to show up all the time and he's getting burned out meeting with everyone. And then all of a sudden his father-in-law, Jethro, that's kind of cool that the father-in-law is the hero in the story. He comes in and he's got some wise counsel for Moses. Like, yo, dude, you're gonna burn yourself out if you keep operating like this. So what does he say? He says, why don't you create leaders of tens, leaders of fifties, leaders of hundreds, and leaders of thousands? What's he saying? He's saying you have to delegate. You have to divide up the ministry or the ministry is gonna kill you. Delegate or die. Wow. Wow. Look at your neighbor. Help me out tonight, cause, cause I want to. Cause some of y'all are some epic crew leaders, but you got to learn how to delegate, or that epic crew is going to crush you. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, neighbor. you have to learn how to delegate, or you're gonna die. <laughs> That's good. Other neighbor. No, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do it. And so what does he do? He, 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 he divides all the people up. And the scripture actually says in Exodus chapter 18, verse 23, Jethro says, if you do this, God will direct you. And watch this, and you will be able to endure. And all this people, and, and all these people also will go to their place in peace. Everyone had their needs satisfied because they figured out a sustainable structure. Yeah. Think about Blue Cruz, right? Like, Every crew that started, it's got two crew leaders, building blocks, co-leaders, calculators, cultivators. All of this is to try to give you a foundation and a structure. But it doesn't just stop there, right? Like, I think most crews, I think on average, are about 12 to 15 is what I've seen, I think, for this season. 
Um, that's awesome. That, that's leaders of 10. Then we've got these things called coaches. We heard from some today, you know, like, great. So, ten, so five crews to a coach. That's like a leader of 50 or so. And then all of a sudden, we've got these things called captains because it goes to hundreds. And so before you know it, now captains are overseeing coaches. And then it gets to thousands. And we have staff members because it gets pretty heavy that we actually have to employ people to make sure that those in the crews are healthy and, and being strengthened and pastored and equipped. Why? Because you're the secret sauce. But it's not just an Old Testament model. It moves in the New Testament. It's good for us to understand some church history because once again, I want our church to mature and grow, that I love our church. I think God's doing some new things for our hour through us, but we are not, like, we're just a part of the big relay race or the big marathon that God has been telling. Like, it's our moment, the baton's in our hand. We're not the best to ever do it. We won't be the best to ever do it. We are playing our part, but we've gotta learn from history. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves repeating the negative parts of history. But like go to the early church, the early church. Do you know what it started with? It started with a group smaller than this, 120 on the day of Pentecost when they're in the upper room. But what happens? The Holy Spirit falls and in a moment, Peter goes out. Remember, they think that they're all drunk because they're speaking in tongues and he goes, no, they're not drunk and he just preaches the gospel. Do you know how many people got saved that day and joined the church that day? 3,000 people. In a 25 year span, they believe the church in Jerusalem was close to 100,000 people in one church. So when I go to the Bible, I don't like see a picture or an indication that, well, the only way to stay healthy is to stay small. I don't see a picture of the, hey, the only way to maintain quality is that you have to manage the quantity. I don't, I don't see that. I don't see that. In fact, do you wanna know how many people were living, they believe in Jerusalem in the early church? They believe it was about 250,000 people living in the city. Homie, half the people were in their one local church. There's no wonder why the Sanhedrin is like, you are indoctrinating all of the people. <laughs> that was a right accusation. <laughs> 50% of the city was in their church. Do we even think 50% of the city even know about our church? We have got work to do. We have got a city to see turned upside down for Jesus. But the secret sauce here, just so we're really clear, because we don't just preach the message of the Bible, we preach the method of the Bible. So the method of the Bible, which we're gonna look at, is this large group of worshipers, and then it's this small group of fellowship. So tonight, this is just as important as anything we just did this past Sunday. We saw 4,000 people in this church past Sunday. But man, if we don't get them into a crew, who knows if they're ever coming back? And it's not about being a big church. It's about being an effective, life-giving church where people can find a home in this city. I can give you all the ingredients and I can give you all the formula and we can draw it all up. But none of it matters if you're not in it because you're the secret sauce and crews are the secret sauce. You know, as you study that church, that early church, what you'll find out is that there was no buildings for the early church until almost like 300 AD. Not because God's against buildings, just because in most cases, as you look at the early church, it was illegal to be a follower of Jesus. Yeah. Understand that every time it gets more difficult for the church, persecution, the church actually thrives and grows in those moments. Yeah. If you study the early church, it was illegal and they had no buildings. But the early church, they believe in the first 300 years, um, especially when it comes to like percentages and per capita, that it never grew faster than it did in the first 300 years. Yeah. Yeah. There's more believers, of course, today, but we're talking about percentage-wise of how many people are on the earth. But it was illegal and there was no buildings. Well, what was the secret sauce? Yeah. The secret sauce was, is that they gathered when they could, but they went from home yeah. to home yeah. in crews. What did they do? Well, the scripture says very clearly, Acts chapter two, verse 42, this is what they did. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. To simplify that today, the apostles' teaching, they didn't have the Bible yet. They would have had the Torah, then they would have the stories of Jesus. Now today, the apostles' teaching is not my teaching, it's God's word, okay? So they opened the Bible. Everyone say the Bible. Bible. The second thing that they do is that they, they fellowship together with breaking of bread. I went to a bricklayer's lunch today. I go to lunches almost every other week with people in our church. 
uh, and almost everything we do at VU has food involved. It's always been a massive line item on the budget. I hope the IRS comes one time and is like, man, you guys spent a lot of food on, a lot of money on food. I'm like, don't you touch our religion, you know? Like, <laughs> like, because I think it's like, I think it's an act of like our religion. I think food is a part of Christianity. I don't think evangelism is very effective without bread and wine, okay? Go back and listen to my message on hospitality. I, I just believe it all throughout the scripture. And you've seen it in your crew too, right? Because people start eating and they relax. They start hanging out, you know? I love, I love Sunday church. I'm not trying to put that down. We need it. We desperately need it. But how many of y'all know it's in conversation where freedom begins to happen? We're not just trying to be an attractional church. We're trying to be a formational church. How many of y'all know you can't have a conversation with a crowd? You have to have a community. You have to have a small group. You have to have a crew. So it's the apostles teaching. It's fellowship. The fellowship, it's breaking of bread. And then it's prayer. So look at this. What were they doing? Bible, fellowship, and prayer. Someone say Bible. Bible. Fellowship, fellowship. And prayer. prayer. Think about your crew. Think about your crew. The ingredients to your crew. I know there's an outline, but, but like those three things should always be happening. If you're playing golf, amazing. Open up the Bible. Give a scripture. Fellowship. Don't curse each other out because someone's beaten one another. I could never do a pickleball crew because I had to apologize to Justin as soon this week. Where's Justin? I apologize. Didn't even make it to catch up. It's amazing. But I played pickle and two days later I had to apologize. So I couldn't do a crew there because um, there's not a lot of fellowship. There's a lot of rivalry. Um, but then it's prayer. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray for each other. And even in this room tonight, like I was just thinking like, what are things that we should be focusing on as crew leaders and crew? Because I'm gonna show you something here towards the end of this talk, but like just, I was chatting with Manu and just four things that were on my heart. And it's just an acronym for the word crew. I I know there's gotta be Bible. I know there's gotta be fellowship. I know there's gotta be prayer, but four things I think that we should all focus on when it just comes to our crew, when it comes to me as a leader, when it comes to you as a leader, four simple words. The first word is the word consistent. Everyone say consistent. Consistent. Like this is just like, I know it's not sexy to preach about consistency, but it's actually what builds a strong life. It's actually what builds a healthy church. If you wanna be taken serious in life, be consistent. It is not what we do occasionally that matters. It's what we do consistently that does. It's what we do that, it's consistency. Some of you like, you had one season and you're here today and you're a little bit discouraged in your leadership. You're like, man, I was really hoping that we'd have like 15 to 20 people and we just had three to five and I, I guess I'm not cut out for it. I, I would challenge that thinking. And I would say, nah, you gotta give it more than one season. You know, oh, I did it for two, I'd give it more than two seasons. You need to get a revelation tonight that this is the secret sauce. You're in the room, you're a part of it, don't give up. We, we have to be committed to being consistent. I, I long for the day, and I think, I think we're actually there, 150 plus different crews going on. I really believe as, in, as we step into 2023 that we need to break the 200 barrier mark, not because it's some metric, but because I really believe it's crews that make this city home for people. Like this city means nothing until you actually have a community. And we have the power, to, we, have a, we have the chance to create that miracle for people. But in order for us to get there, we actually have to get to the end of the season as we get to December, and we added 108 new crew leaders. That's incredible. Yet we might have lost 80. And it's not that they're not in crew. They're just going, I can't lead no more. I'm just too tired. And I'm wondering, maybe you didn't delegate or maybe you haven't cast vision or maybe you had a bad season and you think now that it was you that was the problem. I, I just, I wanna encourage you, be consistent. I think, I think the R that I wrote down is just the word real. Someone say real. real. Like, it, it's gotta be real. And just tonight with you, like, we are not into playing church at VU. I know we have a strong culture and people are good at saying amen and that might be kind of intimidating, but yo, we are jacked up people who have real problems, who are in need of the grace of God. There are no self-righteous leaders in this church. We preach the grace of God. We need to be real. And some of you, you're a building block and you've been a building block for two years. You're ready to be a crew leader. You're hearing it from me. I don't know, man, like, ah. You have been co-leading for a year and a half. 
It's time for you to step up. It's okay to be scared, but you ought to lead crew scared. You ought to just do it scared. You ought to like go for it. Don't, don't back away, be real. And I think your crew should be real. I think it should be a place that people can authentically share, that people can be honest, that people can say what's going on. I think it's good that we temper, that we, we think leadership, in leadership, your crew leaders, meaning as you're leading your crew, I, don't, I think that's a place for people to come and bleed. I don't think it's a wise place for you to go and bleed. Do you understand that? Like I got all sorts of challenges all the time in my life, but I don't get up on Sunday mornings and use the pulpit as a place to bleed out on people. Well, let me tell you about so-and-so who hurt me. Let me tell you about so-and-so who offended me. Let me tell you about what's going on. No, 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 no. I'm the leader. You're the leader. That doesn't mean you should be fake. That means that you need to make sure that you're going to your coach. You're going to your captain. And here's a simple way. I teach our staff it this way. And this is something you got to get into your mind. And you can start to spot it. You'll, you'll start to hear this now. You'll wait. That's not good leadership. Here's what good leaders do. Good leaders... They run positive news down and they run negative news up. So it's always, this by the way, works at your office. It works in your family. Why are you telling me that? I can't solve that problem. That That sounds like gossip. That sounds like negative. That sounds like division. That sounds like you might be sowing discourse. Oh my goodness. You know, in the New Testament, when brothers sow discord, they get marked. I just think we have, to, we have to waken up that going, negative things are gonna happen. Challenge, you're gonna bleed. Things are gonna cut you. Things are gonna hurt you. Learn where to bleed up. Yeah. People in your crew ought to be able to come and be real and share with it. You can share and be real from your story, but it needs to be a scar, not a wound. Yes. You understand? Let me, just, let me just try to illustrate it. There was a, there was a long journey there where DC and, and I were going through infertility. You've heard us share about that. And I wasn't. She was the one who was going to the doctors and uh, it was an eight year journey for us, but I think it was, how many years did you go before you, you shared it? She went six years before she shared it. I think maybe three years before that, I was kind of like, hey, like, I think we should tell more people. But it wasn't my story, it was our story, but it was her story. Maybe for me, I was at a place where I went, I'm ready to like share and ask for your prayer. She wasn't. She was still working through, it was private for her, and she had to come to a moment with, between her and God when she felt like it was appropriate to share publicly, not from a place of a wound, but from a place of going, this hurt me, but I'm strong enough now to give God glory in the midst of it. I, am not, I wanna make sure I'm being clear. I'm not advocating you hiding anything. It's the opposite. I just wanna make sure that you take your secrets and your problems and your frustrations to the right place. You understand me? Number three, what you should be focused on is just an encouraging environment. Encouraging. Like, you don't have to, like, watch T.D. Jakes on YouTube before crew (laughs) and be like, get ready, get ready, get ready. You don't, you like, and I love to, I'm I'm just saying, like, all you have to do is be encouraging. You don't have to be like, I want to add on to what Rich said as I was studying the Church of Pergamum. Um... (laughs) In the Greek, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Some of you are skilled to do that, but you don't, you don't, there's no pressure to do that. You just have to be encouraging. So here's four basic rules to be encouraging. Write these down. What's said in the group stays in the group. Unless it's something that is in your crew handbook that's dangerous, that's abusive. But for the most part, you build trust. You build encouragement. It's trust. It doesn't leave here. Someone shares about their marriage. Someone shares about... Their, their identity, someone shares about loss of job, someone shares about sickness, unless they've given you permission, it stays in the crew. Yeah. Number two, you don't minimize other people's pain. Do you know how you stop being, you know how you become discouraging un, unintentionally? Is when someone shares something real with you and vulnerable and then you one up it by going, that's, that's nothing, let me tell you what I went through. That's not encouraging, just. Number three, don't try to fix people. Just just listen, just listen. Number four, I focus on my own changes, not on changing others. 
This is called an encouraging environment, encouraging environment. So four things we should all focus on. Consistent, real, encouraging. Number four, and this is just so simple, you already know this, but I put down the word welcoming. Good. I'm, trying to make, I'm trying to make it so, so simple for you. Yep. And what I've noticed before in the cruise that I, I was in, but even in my crew, the, the, a couple weeks ago, um, we, were, we have crew in our home and um, a friend asked if they could bring a friend, which was cool, because it's my house. I was, yeah, I appreciate them giving me, wow, I've had some people show up, I'm like, I don't know who you are, but welcome to my house. And um, yeah, you get it. But, um, but they brought a friend and the night got going, there was like 25 people and it got kind of started. Well, we got into discussion, but nobody ever like introduced this new person. This new person didn't go to church. They'd, they'd come on a Sunday like a couple times. And it was like 40 minutes in and like I have to now backtrack and be like, hey, by the way, we have so-and-so. And I just was going, man, that's the most unwelcoming thing. I think sometimes we get too caught up in the program and you just gotta go back to being a good host. If you had someone over to your house for dinner, I know you might be at a bar, or you might be at some uh, place, you might be at a restaurant, but you as the crew leader, you have to set the tone of being welcoming. So the most simple way you can do that is whoever is new, they are the honored guests. Get their name, like learn their name. Say their name out loud from your mouth. Introduce them, don't make, themselves, don't make them introduce themselves. Discover, just set a welcoming environment. Y'all feel me on that? Come on, somebody. I guess the question is this tonight. If a flower doesn't grow, do you blame the seed or do you blame the environment? And so when David says, those that are planted in the house will flourish, I think he's giving us the truth. We have to all ask ourselves, if people come to this church and they're not flourishing, if I'm in this church, I'm not flourishing, why is that? Is it the seed or could it be the soil? Could it be missing sunlight? Could it not be getting enough water, nutrients? It could be multiple things. I think what you and I are controlling or, or working on cultivating is healthy soil, healthy nutrition, healthy nutrients, making sure that it gets enough sunlight, gets enough water. Why, because what happens when the secret sauce, when we get these large groups of worship and when we get these small groups of fellowship, what happens when crews are activated? What happens when we actually start being the church? I'll tell you what happens. There's eight different signs of health that show up in the church and you can start to spot them. And they're all right here in Acts chapter two. Never preached this before, but it spoke to me. And awe came upon every soul. The first sign of a healthy church is that the people in that church are in awe. And don't make me try to convince you of this. Go back to the first time you came to this church. Go back to the first time you went to crew. Whoa, who are these people? What is this place? Wow. Go back to that moment when God spoke to you in that iTech auditorium or when he met you right here at Summit. Whoo! I'm starting to get chills right now. God, who are you? You're doing something in my life. There's an awe that comes upon us. People ought to leave our crews with some awe, some wonder. Whoa, what is this? Who are these people? I've lived, my, I've lived 38 years. I didn't know people could be so kind. Th those people must be fake. You ever hear that about people when they say that about us? That's a good thing. I don't, I don't know if they're genuine. That's a good thing. That means you are projecting and putting something into the earth that they have never seen before. And they have to ask, I wonder, could that even be real? That's not a diss, that's a compliment. Yeah. Everyone over there is so excited. You better believe it. Yeah. Got one life to live. Everywhere else I go in this city, everyone's too cool. Right. We're gonna welcome you. We want people to walk away in some awe. It's a sign that we've got the sauce. Yeah. But look what it says, we're just gonna walk through it. It says, and awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Good. Miracles start happening sign of a healthy church has miracles. I believe we see miracles every week because we see salvation take place every week in every service. But it's not just those kinds, it's we see signs and wonders. We see God at work. We see him doing something in our midst, in you and through you. 
I have Monty to share some stories with me just from crew life. And it's just like, it's unbelievable stories in this season alone. People who are depressed. People on the verge of suicidal thoughts, but came to your crew and you just welcomed them in. You not, might not have been mentioned tonight, but you're more mature than that. You, you find the purpose in it, consistent, real, encouraging, welcoming, Bible, fellowship, prayer. I mean, miracles take place. I could, could be here all night if I started telling you miracles about Voodoo Church. Get ready. We're coming to the end of the year. There's, there's some miracles that are still yet to happen this year for the, for the larger body of this church. This, this building is a miracle, yo. It's a miracle. We didn't strive for this. We didn't look. This came. This is God sent this to us. It says, and all who believe were together and had all things in common. Third word is the word unity. That like, we fight for unity, that it's all in common. Not that we like all enjoy the same style of music or the same style of dress, or the same restaurants, but man, our heart is focused in the right direction. I'm for you and you're for me. I got your back, you got my back. That's powerful, friends. You're a part of a community this past Sunday had 4,000 people show up. You don't know all their names. There's no way you can know all their names. I remember when we first had our launch team, we got it up to 200 people and I tried to memorize everyone's name. And I, I, got, I got close, but I don't remember them anymore, you know? There's, there's, there's too many, I don't know everyone's name in this room, but man, I'm united with you. I got so much love for you. We're doing this together. Yeah. We might not be able to get coffee a whole lot on this side of eternity, but something tells me we got all the time in the world <laughs> to drink all the espresso we want on the other side. We're gonna do it together. It's, I love the Capital C Church, but I love our church, man. Yeah. And we shouldn't let anything divide us or separate us. You shouldn't tolerate any gossip. You shouldn't tolerate any division. Because you go, wait, that's not the sign of a healthy church. Nah, like. And sometimes people gotta go. Sometimes people gotta be, that's okay. That's, that's a, people gotta be pruned out and go to the, they gotta be led where they're being led. But you and I, we have to fight for unity. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. The fourth thing is that you see a healthy church and a healthy sign is that it's marked by generosity. It's just, like they didn't have a year-end vision offering. Instead, if there was any need, they just took all their possessions, put it up and just said, we're gonna take care of people. 100,000 people doing this. Every need was met because they had a heart of generosity. I think generosity is the reasonable response to the gospel that I freely receive, now I freely give. I know it costs you time. I know it's a, it's, a generous, it's a generous act to open up your home or to get a babysitter so you can go to crew. Or, but man, this is a sign that God's at work. This is what the early church was doing. This is what we're doing. May our church always be marked with a spirit of generosity. It's a privilege, not an obligation. <laughs> this is the one I really like. This doesn't get preached a lot in church, but I think it should be. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad, glad and generous hearts. I think the fifth sign is that people are happy. <laughs> you ever been to church where everyone's like, ain't nobody happy here, you know? <laughs> Yeah, going to church on Sunday. I don't want to, you know. <laughs> if we're going to do this thing, I don't want to do it depressed. I don't want to do it sad. I don't want to do it tormented. I, I, we, let's do it happy. Let's be happy. Let's do it together. Life is, life is serious. I don't have to always be serious. We can laugh. Dude, <laughs> It's 70, that's why I love everyone dressed up. You're like, what is this church? I'm preaching, I look like, I look like dazed and confused up here, preaching the Bible. We don't take ourselves too serious, man. Because we want to be, it's happy, we're having fun. This is our community, it's our family. I, church should be enjoyed, not endured. You know, you know, if you're in church, by the way, you can help create an atmosphere that's happy. You can talk back to the preacher, you can laugh even if the joke doesn't hit very good. 
You can talk back to the host. You can make it feel like it's a sense of community by saying, man, we don't have to follow all those rules of formality that I've been at some other place. This place is free and we're happy. We get to do this. I don't have to do it. I get to do it. Some of y'all need to get back to that language. I don't have to do this. I get to do this. I want to come in here and encourage you. I'm going to try to do it at the very end here, like keep going, but come on, man. If you don't do this, what else are you going to be doing? This is the greatest honor of a lifetime, bro. I'm happy. (laughs) What else are we going to be doing? What else? What'd you do last Wednesday? Did you go to a 70s theme party (laughs) with 300 other people and worship God and have God's word opened up and let your hearts become ablaze and your eyes set on fire as you look at the one who saved you? Did last Wednesday night, did someone give you a purpose and a mission to say you can change the world? You can be a part of the great church of Jesus Christ? My guess is you didn't do that. I get to do it. I want to do it. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. Look, it says, glad and generous hearts, verse 47, praising God, praising God. I think a mark of a healthy church and the secret sauce is that it's a house full of worship. House full of worship. I was at a bricklayer's lunch today. Nilson and Betty were there, but I met another couple I'd never met before. They come to the South Miami 6 p.m. service. They had tears in their eyes as they started speaking, and they said, man, two weeks ago, Pastor Rich, I know you weren't in the room. We were watching you on video, but hopefully Pastor Adrian told you. But they had a prayer moment at the end of the service, and it rolled around to 8 p.m. at night. Nobody wanted to leave. They just kept singing, and they said, Pastor Rich, It's a big deal because today we've been hearing a whole bunch of stories about young people and their parents bringing them to church, but our story's different. We got here because our 17-year-old made us come to church here. The worship lingers. I wasn't there. Couldn't be there. I was at another but I'm grateful that it's a purpose-driven church. I'm grateful it's got the secret sauce. I'm grateful that we value the large gathering of worship. We don't pit the two against each other, but I'm grateful that it finds itself in spaces of fellowship that we can testify and tell the story of what God's doing in our life. It's worship. It says, praising God and having favor with all people. I think think the seventh mark is that the church has favor. This This is actually a really fun study because this word shows up all over the Bible and it doesn't get taught very much because it kind of slips into some sometimes some teaching that um, people get worried about that could be called prosperity teaching. I don't believe in a prosperity gospel. I keep saying that over and over again, but I certainly believe that God wants to prosper your soul and I certainly believe in the favor of God because my entire life has been marked by the favor of God and it would be dumb for me to reap the blessing and then not teach you the principle of it. But this church has got favor on it. And you being in it, you ought to just know favor's coming your way. And only a fool would step into the blessing of God and not connect the dot. Now wait a minute. Two years ago, I didn't have this type of supernatural blessing. Wait, what happened two years ago? Wait. I started tithing over there. Wait, 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 wait. I started serving over there. Wow, how did my business double? How did I get, how did I all of a sudden win such affection in people's hearts? How, how come people look to me for authority now? Well, that's because you started leading the parking team. Now there's about 40 other people that look to you as their leader and their pastor. That's called favor, yeah. Yeah. And it's marked this house and it will mark your life. God's opening doors that we could never open. And he's certainly closing doors (laughs) that we need him to close. But let's trust that his hand is on this church. And one of the great signs of health is that the favor of the Lord is upon this place. Oh, we need it. We need it. Some things money can't buy. 
something status can't get you, something's gifting will never open the door for, it can only be God's favor. It's a big deal. We're trying to build a building here at South Miami. It's not a money problem, which that is a problem, but that's not the real problem. The real problem is we gotta get the council members, we gotta get the board, we need favor. We need favor. Before we even ask you for money, we need favor. When you step out into this city, everywhere you go, you represent this place. How you carry yourself, it matters. God's gonna put favor on your life. Taking too long, these weren't supposed to go this long. I'm, I'm gonna finish. Study too much and don't have enough time. Here we go, last one. This is the best one, I think. This really is the best one. Favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The last, the last mark of a healthy church is salvation. And we need to keep our excitement for the lost. We stand up when we hear numbers like 17,000 people have filled out a salvation card because it's the mark that we're actually on mission and it's a sign of health that God's doing something in our midst. You and your crew, you need to not just be encouraging, you need to be evangelistic. I want you to have quality through a consistent relationship, the compound effect, but if you guys are not thinking about adding to that crew and adding people to that crew and getting lost people there, you're gonna dry up. You're gonna become spiritually fat. What keeps us strong, what keeps us stern is when we keep reaching out into the darkness and pulling people back into the light. So I love preaching the Church of Revelation, but yo, I gotta figure out a way every time I do deep Bible study to somehow make a pivot to that person who's like, what the heck are these folks doing in here all day long? I have to appeal to that person that they could hear the story of the gospel. And week after week, people are saved and the Lord continues to add to our number daily, just like he did in the early church. Why? Because it's the secret sauce. And you, my friend, are the secret sauce. And you, my friend, you matter to this house and we can't do what we're doing without your participation. So I close this way. These are the three things that I'm asking you to do. Number one, love the people. Love the people, touch the people, pray for the people, visit the people. Someone gets married, be there. Someone passes away, you be the first one to call. Someone goes to the hospital, let us know. I can't beat all those places. You represent me, you represent this house when you're there. I need you to love the people, I need you to keep that in your heart. When you lead, people let you down, people hurt you. Get that out of your heart. Forgive quickly, stay sweet, keep loving the people. Keep loving them, keep loving them, keep loving them. Someone says something about you, someone disappoints you, forgive and keep loving the people. I watch so many leaders get wounded, they stop loving people. Start living isolated, start living small. You might've had a bad crew season, but come on man, the system, the structure, it's not our structure, it's not our system, it's the structure and system of God. So don't give up on the system. Don't give up on the structure. Try again. Love the people. Number two, connect, connect the dots. Yeah. What I mean is that like, I love Instagram, but our church information strategy is not Instagram. It's cruise. Yeah. Yeah. We should be able to share something in here and quickly it should be able to get out tonight. Right. Hey, this is where we're focusing. Let everybody know. It's called cascading information. Don't keep it in the room. When you're pastoring people, connect dots. The same way I'm helping some of you tonight, some of you came in going, I was about to resign and let Manu know, and now all of a sudden God started speaking to you. But it wasn't just God speaking to you, it was a pastor who was shepherding you and connecting some dots going, wait a minute, you have to do the same thing for people in your life. You don't have to beat them over the head, but you gotta teach them and give them the truth because it's the truth that sets us free. Connect some dots. Last one, release leaders. We have three more crews. And don't just focus on getting them full and having a good, I want you to focus on the next three crews of looking at your crew and going, who can, who can lead a crew? Who, how can we divide this thing up? All right. Maybe some of you would even give someone your epic, awesome crew and you would start as a pioneer all over again. It's called church planting, okay? Maybe you'd go, you know what? This is pretty good. And you've been doing this with me for a while. I'm gonna give you the location. I'm gonna give you the leaders. I'm gonna give you the people. And I'm gonna step over here now and I'm gonna begin. If I did it once, I could do it again. I need you to challenge people in your crew. This is a big city. People need home. You need it home. They need home. We close the night and we'll sing, Mono will come up, but William Booth, 
founder of the Salvation Army. In his 80s, almost blind, gives his final and most famous speech, Royal Albert Hall. He's let out without even a microphone. And he speaks to the crowd and he simply says this. He says, while women weep as they do now, I'll fight. And while children go hungry as they do now, I'll fight. While men go to prison in and out, in and out as they do now, I'll fight. And where there is a poor lost girl upon the streets, while there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll fight, I'll fight, I'll fight to the very end. And may that be the heart and the spirit of this group right here. As we finish this season, let's keep fighting. And as we step into 2023, let's step into the night carrying the light of Jesus going, we got the secret sauce. We got the secret sauce. Come on.